Standing behind us here is Otago Street uh, Tall White House Studios. This is where we recorded uh, Positive Education and all the early SOMA tracks. In fact, this is where we, we the whole operation was run from for about two years in the beginning. So this is where it all kind of started. the West End, we were both working together in a, a place called uh, Chimichangas and it was like uh, one of the new West End bars and I met this tall guy who used to push people out the way when they used to put like bad music on the, the sound system and Orb would be like, no I want to put my music on the sound system. I want to put my bad music yeah, on the system. Yeah, I want to put my even, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, I was the same, I was exactly the same, I was like no we have to listen to this. And he was the only other guy that had a similar taste in music. Like, you know, he, he was into like dance music per se, some early house music, like things like Mantronics, ACR, bands like that, um, mixed with sort of funk and early house music. And I, I was exactly the same. I was like, my God, you know, somebody else that likes the same music. Because believe it or not, back then, uh, not everybody liked that kind of music or had an affinity or with that kind of music or even wanted to become a DJ. Be becoming a DJ was, was, wasn't really seen as being uh, anything that was remotely cool in any way. But for us, when we got chatting and we got past all the kind of uh, pushing and shoving, we kind of decided, oh, you know, we really wanted to, to do this. With the kind of DJing thing, it, it was it was a bit of a kind of disease. It was, you know, it was, you, you feel you wanted to play your music to other people. It wasn't a kind of lifestyle choice or particularly glamorous, you know. Completely it was a cathartic, selfish <laughs> process. There weren't that many nights with uh, a kind of really strong musical attitude in Glasgow. There wasn't. Uh, really kind of anywhere that was really playing a lot of the the new stuff that was coming out of America and I think that's that's where we kind of made the jump was uh, we were buying these records uh, in various stores in Glasgow and just not hearing them being played out in any kind of great amount so that was our kind of real foot in the door and then that's that's how Slam started that was on the uh, a night in a, a club called Tempan Alley and uh, that was very much a kind of are kind of laying down the blueprint of what we thought, you know, a Glasgow needed music. It, it was like being an outsider running running a night in a place like Tim Pan Alley because it was a it was pretty much um, inher inherently a gangsters <laughs> club, you know, uh, which which nobody really would want to go to. But downstairs they had a venue that held about two hundred people, and we said, well, okay, we'll 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 we'll, we'll do it. We'll take it on. We got this guy. Um, Dr. Bob, I think he was a psychiatrist, and he uh, he came down with like this crazy sort of Pink Floyd style light show. Smoke, uh, 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 you smoke know, machines and we those had oil like, lamps. Yeah, we had like a couple of like podium dancers. We had like that, not not in a not in a sort of CD way. Girls but, in cages. Yeah, <laughs> well, we're just trying to do something different. But we also wanted to kind of open Glasgow up to a, a different crowd. There was a very kind of set type of person that went to the, the sub club over the weekend or to other clubs, you know, and it, they aligned themselves. And I think we wanted to kind of break that taboo and say, this is a kind of totally fresh look at clubbing in year, Glasgow. Yeah, year zero. <laughs> the arches coming along, that was a real kind of, that was a real bonus, you know, it, it being such a, a, a kind of unusual venue. We've had a great time in there, you know, it's even from the first night, the first night was just fantastic. Um, and then we kind of, we, we ran our own kind of individual Friday night, which was just myself and Stuart kind of DJing um, for many years. And then it, it grew into kind of pressure, which became a, a three room monster with just every name you can imagine having passed through the doors. It's had such a fantastic roster of inspiring artists coming through for anyone from Jeff Mills to Richie Horton to now people like Ben Clock, BBS One, Marcel um, Detman, yeah, and... just people like that, and you know, really inspiring, inspiring music, you know. And we've always, always had that kind of um, booking policy, 
we've always been kind of look, trying to look over the brow of the hill musically. And it's not it's not just a techno club, you know. It's it's quite got quite a broad remit musically pressure because it has the three rooms, um, so people can go to a pressure night and hear a lot of different styles of music. It was just completely natural for me, for me anyway, and, and for for all just to want to go in and emulate what you were kind of hearing and you know what you were playing. The first record was Eterna. It's a lot of people's favourite record but I, th I think it sounds to me like it's your first time in the studio or something. We never really expected people to kind of like it or kind of get into it. It was just that it was something that we wanted to do for ourselves m more than anything else and then when other people started to pay attention like Pete Tong and people it like got, that yeah. kind of uh, paid up attention. It very quick and, and you know shops like uh, Eastern Block in Manchester were screaming for it you know independent kind of record shops across the UK was screaming for it. In fact, I, 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 would, I, I think it sounds it's surprisingly polished considering the equipment we were using and it was our first time in the studio. I, I mean, I'm quite incredible. When I listen to it now, I think it actually has stood the test of time. It's maybe not as good as some of our later records, but, but for the first time in the studio, I think it's, it's, it's really pretty good, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Positive education was the one that went global though, yeah. you know, that, that brought the, the label, ourselves and Glasgow to the attention of a lot of people that might not have known that, that, that Glasgow had anything to offer in the kind so of So all of a sudden you'd be getting calls from like, you know, Felix or... Richie Horton. Or, yeah, Richie was, or Harrison Crump or, you know, so then the label stopped just becoming a, a Glasgow focus and, and, and had a kind of almost like a global focus quite quickly you know also people like Ralph Lawson from Back to Basics uh, would, had his Ataku um, project on there and you know it was a very open door for uh, good music or what we thought was good music. The new album is called Reverse Proceed and the basic concept, if, if you want to call it that, not such a concept, I think the concept thing came later, but I think what we were trying to do was find a, a kind of more organic way of making music that, that didn't involve kind of necessarily looking at a laptop or sitting in front of a computer, clicking a mouse, and I think we'd heard a lot of music uh, around that had this kind of somehow some kind of homogenous stereo quality, so we're, but we're kind of looking to do something that, 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 that had, a, had a little bit more substance, but uh, was electronic, but had a sort of human feel in it. The mainstay was the Sequentix Cyclone. The basic concept is about going back and discovering uh, equipment we used to use. Uh, we made an album in 1999, Pressure Funk, using the external trigger, uh, instrument trigger uh, from the 909. And we just kind of wanted to get back to a hands-on process, a more tactile process of making music uh, and not necessarily staring at a computer screen to, to try and realise that or moving notes. It was more about kind of getting, getting involved, changing things, changing parameters on the modular synth, which is the other key, <laughs> which is the other key piece in the jigsaw. Uh, and it was just about getting in and moving the parameters and doing something a lot more tactile. We used to use the 909 in a very similar way to this uh, sequence of the Cyclone and uh, you know always used to throw up some very interesting uh, patterns and sounds. We also used Ableton uh, as the main kind of recording instrument so that's come in very very handy. Uh, one of our old keyboards, the Jupiter 6 Roland, this is a beast, um, was used on many of our kind of earlier tracks so uh, we dusted it down and got it out for this session. So we started with the sequencer and we started just kind of making various patterns and then we, we, we discovered a modular synth and then we were in the, pro the process of writing like Orden might, might be on the 909, I might be on the sequencer and the modular synth and it would just be like a very organic pr process, almost like having a guitar or, or having some kind of instrument or you know, it was like very tactile, very tactile um, process of, of, of making music. You know, somehow making music mechanically, but making music also organically as well. And but then not being conscious of the fact that it wasn't a retrogressive thing. It had like a, an element of progression. It's much easier sometimes just to turn to a software 
uh, uh, version than, than actually fire up the real thing. But there is something about the real thing and certain aspects of, the, of what it can do that, that, and the way that you work with the interface that, that change the like outcome use, of what you do. We would use, we would jam. I mean, most of the tracks were done like like a band rehearsing or something. They would. Uh, jam but so we would jam with the 909 we might not always use it in the, the, the finished process but we would use the modular um, and the modular synth um, is, is a modern modular synth uh, <laughs> it's got a life of its own yeah it has a life of its own you're never really sure what it's gonna throw back at you you know maybe you know a finger in the wrong place or a turn of a dial and Especially with the modular, you, you know, you, you've got to be quite careful, you know, how much you twist certain kind of, because you can lose a sound sometimes, you know. I mean, you, you, you're kind of doing, you're sort of doing this, you know, kind of jamming, doing this, as opposed to sort of sitting, doing this and going, oh, I'll move that there, or I'll do this and I'll do that. And there's something really liberating about that. But the influences for this album, I have to say, were not only the equipment we were using. We went way back to, to even the 60s, you know, like to old electronic stuff. And uh, also listening to things like YMO, Yellow Magic Orchestra, some even some kraut rock stuff, you know. Uh, because we wanted to be influenced. We wanted to, to grab influences that, that influenced the music that, that influenced us. Because yeah, the, yeah, the music it's that influenced like a double step back. The, the music that influenced us was the Detroit Techno. But what influenced Detroit Techno? I think we'd heard a lot of albums that were, weren't were really designed as albums. They were kind of a collection of club tracks or, and you know, that's nothing new um, for Slam. Yeah, and we definitely yeah. didn't want to do that. We definitely didn't that's want not, to do that. That's nothing new for Slam because I think our albums have always had like a, a, a listening ele element to them. But we decided to try and sequence the album as such where it was, it was a continuous listen. So we'd have like various segues, we would take, you know, we, you know, it's a cliche, but we'd take you on a journey so that one track would sort of melt out, the other one would start. A completely selfish process because in, in, in the days of kind of digital downloads, people then take what they want from an album or they'll take one track or they'll take several tracks, but they'll listen to them in an order which they weren't intended. Um, so we kind of wanted to, 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 to kind of limit that option and make kind of almost force people to listen to the yeah. album as it was supposed to be made. I can remember like buying albums, you know, maybe you, you would have heard one or two of the tracks, but you bought the album, listened to it in the order that the artist had de designed you to listen to it. And you always came away, you know, liking different tracks from, from the one that you kind of bought it from. And as Stuart says, that was, that was the idea behind this album, is almost to, to force the listener to listen to them in the order that, uh, we chose. Or perhaps encourage would be a better word. <laughs> <laughs> no, no force. <laughs> it's safe to say that it has influenced how we, we will be working in the future. Um, we will take it live um, and be running it, you know, doing a proper live. When we were piecing the album together and, and kind of writing, there, there was just a little bit at the back of your mind about how this would transfer to live. So we're in the kind of throes of of obviously, you know, thinking about how, how this album would transfer to to a far more live setup, but th there are constraints of just how much gear you can take on the roads. Um, but it is, it, I mean, the album's quite soundscapey, you know, so there's maybe different elements, visuals and stuff like that that we'd like to kind of tie in, but uh, that's that that's for a little further down the road. <laughs>